welcome to em rapid 2022 myself dr navin mohan associate professor of emergency medicine at amrita institute of medical sciences kochi and today we shall discuss about uh, aortic syndromes to be precise acute aortic syndrome so what is acute aortic syndrome it is nothing but a modern terminology for symptomatic and life threatening disorders of the thoracic as well as the abdominal aorta and usually they require urgent evaluation and treatment if not the patient will die so how do you differentiate between acute aortic disease and chronic aortic disease acute aortic disease is distinguished from chronic aortic disease at an arbitrary time point of 2 weeks from initial clinical presentation for example the patient develops chest pain now and he presents to the emergency department within the next 24 hours it is termed hyperacute aortic disease whereas if the patient presents to the emergency department after 24 hours till up till 14 days after onset of symptoms it's termed acute aortic syndrome and if the patient presents to the emergency department after 14 days till 90 days after onset of symptoms it is termed subacute aortic disease and if the presentation is after 90 days it is termed chronic aortic disease so this is the classification that has been given in up to date so moving on to the spectrum of life threatening aortic emergencies that we usually encounter in the ed there are seven entities aortic dissection being the most commonest aortic intramural hematoma intimal tear without hematoma penetrating aortic ulcer periaortic hematoma aortic aneurysmal leakage ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm so the most important ones are aortic dissection aortic intramural hematoma penetrating aortic ulcer and ruptured triplet so moving on to the setting of aortic dissection so when does dissection happen it usually happens in patients who are having chronic hypertension untreated uh, hypertension or in patients who have got some factor that leads to the degeneration of the tunica media of the aortic wall this is the cross section of aorta as we all know inside inside there are three layers inside layer is tunica intima then comes tunica media tunica adventitia right and any factor that leads to degeneration of the media such as bicuspid aortic valve marfan syndrome ehlers danlos syndrome or if the, the patient has already got a family history of aortic dissection all these things can lead to degeneration of the media of the aortic wall so that is the setting another thing is patients who are uh, on chronic cocaine abuse or patients who are on amphetamine all these things will increase the risk of atherosclerosis and thereby increases the chances for aortic dissection for patients who have already undergone a cardiac surgery they are also at risk for the, at risk for aortic dissection so while taking the history in a, in a, in any case of chest pain these things are important cocaine abuse prior cardiac surgery all these things because because usually what happens is a patient coming to the emergency department with chest pain we always almost always think about acute coronary syndrome although acs is the most common cause of chest pain in ed the chances for aortic dissection as well as acute pulmonary embolism these things will have to be also be born in mind okay that has to, that has to be ruled out so any mechanism which involves weakening of the medial layer and increasing intimal wall stress will lead to aortic dissection and what are the ways in which aorta responds to the stress here one aorta can dilate an aneurysm can develop a penetrating ulcer can develop an intramural hemorrhage can happen aortic dissection can happen and even aortic rupture so moving on to the pathophysiology of uh, aortic dissection 
what you are seeing here is the longitudinal section of the aorta same thing here also the same thing it's the magnified view of the aorta and what you're seeing here is a violation of the tunica intima here it here it is it's the blood right this is the aortic wall tunica intima media adventitia so there ha, 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 there is a violation in the tunica intima of the aorta and that allows blood to enter the space and finally this blood will keep dissecting between the intimal and the adventitial layer like this to keep dissecting 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 and what happens is this is the lumen of the aorta blood fl flows in this direction suppose heart is heart is here and blood flows in this direction if there happens to be a tear in the tunica intima the blood will take an alternative route and it will form a let's like suppose alternative route and suppose there is no break here what happens is the blood will keep rotating here here itself so a false lumen will be created in the wall of the aorta in the usually in the tunica media okay suppose a break happens here the blood will go through this route and finally enter the aorta itself okay suppose the break happens here blood will leak out of the tunica adventitia into the body cavities and that is cat catastrophic okay because there is blood loss into the body spaces and naturally patient will have hypotension shock and all and finally death so there is a bimodal age, age distribu distribution in younger patients with predisposing factors which i have already mentioned and in elderly patients usually more than 50 years with chronic hypertension or coronary artery disease aortic dissection can happen in both these kind of patients younger patients as well as chronic like el elderly patients with predisposing factors as well as chronic hypertension but in young females usually aortic dissection is rare but it can happen in elderly females okay so what you're seeing here is the aorta here it's the heart here it's the aorta and as per studies what we have found out is that the the primary location of aortic tear is usually in the ascending aorta usually it happens in the ascending aorta to be precise in the sinotubular junction this is the sinotubular junction which is at the start of the ascending aorta and around 50 to 65 percentage of uh, aortic dissection happens here itself and the second point is just beyond the left subclavian artery here it's the left subclavian artery around 20 to 30 percentage of dissection happens here at the junction between the ascending and the descending aorta here this point So this is again an explanation. Here it's the cross section of the aorta, and if we look at through the cross section, we, we, blood is flowing through this lumen, and th there happens to be a break in the intimal flap, tunica intima, the internal elastic membrane. Then the blood, which will naturally tend to create flow dissect between the tunica intima and the tunica adventitia in the, in the tunica media area and that will create a false lumen and this is called aortic dissection as i've already mentioned so how do you classify aortic dissection there are three cla two classifications basically Stanford classification and the Bakey classification. In the Stanford classification, it's type A and type B. So Stanford class has classified it into type type A as well as type B. Type A involves the ascending aorta. Type B involves the descending aorta. 
type a involves the ascending aorta and it may progress to involve the arch as well as the thoraco abdominal aorta as well okay two classes two entities and type b involves the uh, descending uh, thoracic aorta or even the descending uh, uh, thoraco abdominal aorta distal to the left subclavian artery without involvement of the ascending aorta okay so how, how is it imp important here because usually in type a uh, to stand for type a aortic dissection patients will generally go end up in surgery type b many many cases can be managed uh, uh, medically also okay so moving on to the second classification that is debakey classification debakey has classified it into type 1 type 2 type 3a type 3b so type 1 involves the ascending aorta arch as well as the descending aorta and it may progress to involve the abdominal aorta as well whereas type 2 is confined to the ascending aorta type 3a uh, invo it involves the descending uh, thoracic aorta distal to the left subclavian artery here it is the left subclavian artery so this involves uh, aortic dissection distal to the left uh, subclavian artery and but proximal to the celiac artery what you are seeing here it's the celiac artery so but proximal to the celiac artery type 3b the section involves the, uh, the thoracic and abdominal aorta distal to the left subclavian artery but it can extend be even beyond the celiac artery so these are the various classifications stanford and debakey so these are usually asked, asked in exams but uh, another classification which has come up is Swenson's classification, which is to include the intramural hematoma and the aortic ulcer as well, the penetrating aortic ulcer as well. So this is not included in the previous classification of Stanford and Debakey. So if you look at the diagram here, what you're seeing here is the, there is a intimal tear and a classic dissection you're seeing here with separation of the tunica intima and the media and you can see two lumens here here one here outside here here are two lumens are two one false lumen is there and there is a flap here okay in intramural hematoma what you're seeing here class two intramural hematoma there is a separation of intima and media but there is no intimal tear or uh, intimal tear as well okay here here there is a intimal tear here there is no intimal tear there is just an intramural hematoma, some blood collection and clot inside the tunica uh, media. Okay. Then comes class 3. Class 3, you can see there is a small intimal tear here. Small intimal tear. But there is no hematoma. And there is just a small eccentric bulge at the tear site. So the, the dissection as such is very limited dissection. Okay. Then comes class four. Here you can see a white white color here. This is a atherosclerosis, and there is an atherosclerotic ulcer penetrating to the adventitia with the surrounding hematoma that is usually subadventitia. So this is called a penetrating aortic ulcer, penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. And class five, what you're seeing here is a cardiac catheterization and that has resulted in the tear in the tunica intima and that is that has in turn res resulted in the iatrogenic or a traumatic aortic dissection okay so this is the swenson's classification intended to include both the intramural hematoma an entity of intramural hematoma as well as the penetrating aortic ulcer class one two three four What are the pathophysiological consequences of aortic dissection? So depending on where exactly the aortic dissection has happened, 
several consequences can occur before that you will have to understand the cross section of the heart the layers of the heart here it's the fibrous pericardium this is this is, this is the normal pericardium okay outside fibrous per pericardium then parietal pericardium then visceral pericardium in between the visceral pericardium and the parietal pericardium lies the pericardial cavity okay so this has to be understood so in the ascending aorta suppose this section happens it can lead to hemopericardium that means if suppose there is a dissection happening here hemopericardium can happen and the blood can enter this pericardial cavity here okay so uh, some there is some accumulation of blood in the pericardial cavity now that that is called as hemopericardium and if there is hemopericardium naturally what happens is cardiac tamponade at times patient can have sudden syncope or even sudden death okay because the heart is unable to pump hypo hypotension hypoperfusion shock and finally death okay that is about ascending aorta so the other, the other possibility is if this if the dissection happens in the ascending aorta the blood can spill over into the right hemithorax and if the spillage is too much invariably sudden death will happen so that is about dissection involved uh, involving the uh, consequences of aortic dissection involving the ascending aorta what if the dissection involves the arch of the aorta if dissection involves the arch of the aorta then blood can spill over into the mediastinum resulting in a mediastinal hematoma the other possibility is uh, an inter in, uh, uh, blood collection in the in, uh, in the septum interatrial septum so in an echocardiogram you can see this is an echocardiogram the interatria you can see the collection that's called an interatrial inter septal hematoma which can lead on to cardiac conduction defects other possibility is a compression of the adjacent pulmonary artery or the pulmonary trunk and features related relating to that what if the aortic dissection happens in the descending aorta it can lead on to spillage blood spillage into the left hem hemoth left uh, lung pleural cavity and that can lead to left hemothorax and sudden death at times blood can even spill over to the adjacent esophagus uh, creating profuse hematemesis and other poss possibilities uh, that, that's about descending aorta then moving on to the abdominal aorta if the blood if the aortic dissection ha occurs there and suppose it ruptures the section ruptures it can lead on to retroperitoneal hemorrhage as well as an intraperitoneal hemorrhage okay so depending on where exactly the 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 depending on the uh, site of aortic dissection and where exactly the rupture happens the clinical symptoms and signs can vary so what are the causes of hypotension that you will have to suspect in a case of acute aortic dissection there are three causes hypovolemia that means hemorrhagic shock or because of cardiac failure or even neurogenic shock okay if in a case of uh, aortic dissection there is extreme uh, blood loss into the false lumen of the aortic wall that can that itself can result in a hypovolemia or if the blood if there is a rupture of the uh, aorta aortic dissection and it leaks into the thorax causing a massive hemothorax that can result in hypovolemia hyper hemorrhagic shock or if there is a retroperitoneal hemorrhage that can lead to hemorrhagic shock if there is bowel ischemia with or without hematemesis that also can lead to hemorrhagic shock uh then comes cardiac failure so you have to when, whenever you think about whenever you in, in case discussions and all when you're talking about the causes of hypotension 
you divide it into hypovolemia related cardiac failure related neurogenic shock related so if it is hypovolemia mention about these things if it is cardiac failure mention about these things it can be secondary to hemopericardium with tamponade i have already mentioned about regarding hemo hemopericardium then about uh, complete heart block if the hemorrhage happens into the interatrial septum patient can develop complete heart block that can cause hypotension and uh, if the aortic dissection uh, finally leads on to a coronary artery dissection and mi finally leading on to uh, myocardial infarction that can lead to left ventricular dysfunction you got it right aortic dissection coronary artery dissection, uh, dissection leading to myocardial infarction and that in turn leading to left ventricular dysfunction all these things can result in cardiac failure and that itself can cause hypotension then moving on to the third entity that is neurogenic shock which is quite rare it's usually caused by spinal cord ischemia or infarction and that should be considered when the patient has an obvious para or tetraplegia with bradycardia and hypotension and warm peripheries okay so this entity is quite rare so moving on to the next part the aortic intramural hematoma what is aortic intramural hematoma as you can see here there is a uh, collection of blood which is confined within the medial layer of the aorta but there is no a detect no detectable intimal tear the tunica intima is quite intact and uh, this usually happens because of an infarction of the aortic media because uh, suppose this, we all know that the aortic media is supplied by the vasa vasorum okay if suppose there is a problem in the vasa vasorum uh, suppose there is an injury to the vasa vasorum and that can lead on to collection of blood within the medial layer of the aorta and that will lead to aortic intramural hematoma this is a cross section of the aorta you can just imagine this is a cross section of aorta here here it's the true true lumen through which blood flows this is the tunica intima tunica media tunica adventitia and blood is pooled in the tunica media because the vasa vasorum is cut and usually it involves the aortic intramural hematoma involves the descending aorta so it can be termed type b intramural hematoma and there are two possibilities in intramural hematoma one is it can it may resolve spontaneously or it may lead to aortic dissection or even aneurysm or even rupture okay so aortic intramural hematoma is a precursor to acute aortic dissection or even it is associated with a penetrating aortic ulcer and most of the cases like around 62% cases occur in females treatment is usually in type a intramural hematoma usually require early surgery just like uh, aortic dissection and type b requires a medical management then moving on to penetrating aortic ulcer so this is a longitudinal section of the aorta and you can see this is this is a this is also same thing a longitudinal section of the aorta but the wall of the aorta is uh, zoomed in so we can see an ulcerating this is atherosclerotic there we can see an ulcer in the an athero, uh, ulcerating atherosclerotic lesion here which is trying to penetrate the uh, elastic lamina and finally when it penetrates the elastic lamina it forms a hematoma here okay hematoma formation within the media of the aortic wall here but as you can see here the blood is not flowing freely through this cavity hence it can't be called a, a dissection blood is flowing through this the normal cavity itself so a false lumen is not created here because uh, uh, this lumen is filled with the filled with a uh, hematoma okay but definitely penetrating aortic ulcer can lead to aortic dissection in the future or even perforation of the 
aorta this is the cross section this is a ultrasound view you can see a small penetrating aortic ulcer here so finally penetrating aortic ulcer can lead to intramural hematoma aortic dissection or even perforation of intramural hematoma as is shown here aortic dissection or a pseudo aneurysm formation or even rupture and extra aortic hematoma so in an emergency department the prime thing is suspecting in any case of chest pain you will have to suspect the uh, diagnosis of acute aortic dissection or acute aortic syndrome depending on the character of the chest pain and other symptoms which may like indirectly be related to related to the aortic dissection as such okay so never in any case of chest pain never blindly think take take uh, take it for granted that this is acute coronary syndrome think about acute aortic dissection as well as acute pulmonary embolism so the symptoms are listed as here it depends on the site of intimal disruption so as the dissection progresses the symptoms can also change okay usually what they mention is abrupt sharp chest pain radiating to an area between the scapulae with a feeling of impending doom because of usually because of hemorrhagic shock like blood overflow and spillage into the uh, thoracic cavity or wherever and uh, hypotension shock that that may be the result, uh, the, re the reason for impending doom and uh, as i already mentioned in stanford type a usually involving the ascending aorta usually patient 60% of the patient presents with chest pain whereas in stanford type b patients usually present with the abdominal pain okay and also back pain also same can happen in a uh, ruptured triple a also abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture similar presentation may be similar to stanford type b aortic dissection then if the uh, dissection has happened distally patient can have back pain flank pain abdominal pain and if the dissection has happened uh, in or near the carotid artery stroke like symptoms can happen here because of blood flow inhibition and uh, neurological symptoms can also happen paraplegia if the spinal cord uh, blood supply is interrupted paraplegia can happen and if the dissection is proximal to the aortic root i have already mentioned hemopericardium cardiac tamponade can happen and similarly features of cardiac tamponade the back stride all these things can, can happen and uh, the heart attack mi stroke aortic regurgitation syncope and all these things are usually associated with type a the ascending one ascending aortic dissection so the clinical features are related to the the, the, the signs and the signs which are related to hemopericardium okay suppose aortic dissection as the uh, type a aortic dissection as led to hemopericardium patient can have signs related to that pulses paradoxes that means systolic bp more than 10 mm mercury fall during inspiration a pain heart sound distended neck veins shock the back side and all then if the dissection uh happens at the aortic root there can be aortic root dilatation and also incomplete apposition of the aortic leaflets and that can lead to aortic regurgitation and that itself in turn can lead to wide pulse pressure okay and what are the features related to compression of a, of the true aortic lumen there can be a systolic murmur of over the aorta okay and other thing is one very major th important thing is pulse deficit can that can happen in radial or femoral arteries pulse deficit so here is the just look at the diagram here if the, if there is a vessel occlusion of the if there is a coronary artery occlusion that can lead to st elevation mi if there if there is a common carotid artery occlusion that can lead to any type of stroke a subclavian artery occlusion can lead to an ischemic upper limb 
celiac or mesenteric uh, vessel uh, artery occlusion can lead to ischemic bowel if the if the renal vessel in, is involved frank hematuria spinal artery is involved sudden onset onset painless paraplegia okay so whenever you are taking the history all these things should be borne in mind not not only the character of the of the chest pain other things which may be like completely unrelated to uh, aortic dissection such as uh, stroke and uh, ischemic upper limb or even ischemic bowel abdominal pain uh, the blood in the uh, urine paraplegia all these things have to be taken borne in mind because all these vessels the the coronary vessel carotid vessel supply vein celiac renal spinal artery all these things are in turn related to the aorta the, the primary blood vessel is aorta itself okay so all these things are connected to aorta so symptoms can revolve around these uh, vessels also so another thing in sign is you have to monitor is the bp that can be a, a bp difference of more than 20 mm mercury between the arm and if there is a if, if i take bp right in the right hand it's uh, suppose it's 160 on the left hand it's 100 definitely the difference between the systolic bp difference is more than 20 mm mercury between the arms and then that is independently associated with dissection okay then other thing which can happen is if the if there is happens to be an aneurysm and this aneurysm dilatation which compresses the regional structures such as esophagus recurrent laryngeal nerve superior cervical sympathetic ganglion and all these things can lead to dysphagia hoarseness horner syndrome and all these things so even cardiac as well as neurological symptoms uh, signs have uh, has to be uh, looked for in, in any case of aortic dissection hypertension history this patient will have a history of definitely hypertension and if hypotension is there then the prognosis is really grave it's that suggest itself suggests i've already mentioned uh, the three reasons for uh, uh, hypotension in a case of acute aortic dissection okay so look for that so moving on to the investigations usually the clinical manifestations are non specific and uh, a proper history taking proper uh, properly eliciting the signs and uh, having a high suspicion of acute aortic dissection is important and that itself but even even if, even if you are getting all the signs that may not be very specific for diagnosing uh, acute aortic dissection always you will have to do further investigation so ecg has to be taken to rule out acs but uh, even if ecg is showing an st elevation mi always think about coexisting aortic dissection also because the the extension of type a dissection to coronary ostia itself can cause uh, acs and that itself that can lead to ecg changes as well so d dimer is another thing if it is less than 500 studies say that if it is if it is less than 500 nanograms per deciliter it's unlikely to be a aortic dissection So always send the preoperative blood investigations anyway. Uh, even if the even if the patient is having uh, acute coronary syndrome, all these pre-cath investigations has to be sent. So send the pre preoperative blood investigations as a routine. And uh, chest X-ray that is very important. And chest X-ray usually you can see a widened mediastinum, abnormal aortic contour, pleural effusion. displacement of aortic intimal calcification deviation of trachea mainstream bronchial esophagus this, this chest x ray findings in acute uh, aortic dissection uh, i've seen many times being asked in exams so just memorize the various findings so this is the this is the chest x ray oh, you can see a widened mediastinum here there is a loss of aortic knuckle here a widened mediastinum and a globular heart thoracic aortic dissection so this is you can see a, a soft soft tissue shadow which is peripheral to a calcified aortic annulus so that is also suggest of aortic dissection a globular heart which may suggest a large hemopericardium especially if the history and everything is very suggestive then pleural effusion can happen if there happens to be a spillover of blood that happens here rupture of 
aortic dissection and it spills over to the cavities hemothorax and all these things can happen and uh, but the definitive evaluation to find out it's not x-ray anyway we'll have to do a transthoracic echocardiogram and this is a transthoracic echocardiogram the parasternal long axis view and in that at times you may be able to see a dissection flap here here it is the left atrium here it is the mitral valve left ventricle aorta this is the right ventricle so this is the aorta so at times you may you may be able to see a dissection flap here but the <clears throat> this is all like many a times you may not be able to find this also because the dissection flap can be seen only if, if it involves the ascending aorta okay the trunk the root of the aorta if it is dissection is somewhere far away you may not be able to see visualize it in the transthoracic echo but uh, transthoracic echo is helpful to find out aortic regurgitation uh, hemo aortic regurgitation or, or even hemopericardium and some ischemia ischemic changes the sensitivity like of uh, intimal flap within the aortic lumen is approximately 80% for type a dissections but only 50% for type b that means type a means involving the ascending uh, aorta then comes trans esophageal echo trans esophageal echo in experienced hands has got a sensitivity of around uh, 90 to 98% this is this is trans esophageal echo and that is usually preferred for patient for unstable patients only okay but if trans esophageal uh, echo is not available in your center you can go ahead with the uh, ct angio immediately uh, but uh, ct angio and mr angio is the imaging modality of choice in any case of a case, case of suspected aortic dissection and it shows a uh, intimal uh, this is a ct uh, angio and uh, here you can see the intimal flap in both the ascending aorta as well as the descending aorta okay the intimal flap can be seen the white one is the true lumen the dark one is the false lumen true lumen has got blood that is why it is white here also same thing here it's the descending aorta this is the white one is the true lumen the dark one is the false lumen and here it is the intimal flap this is diagnostic of aortic dissection and at the level of the arch you can see a true lumen here false lumen here here okay so this is ct angios the definitive investigation for diagnosing acute aortic dissection and there is a mention regarding the triple rule out ct tro ct uh, which is a coronary pulmonary and aortic ct angio uh, together basically to differentiate between the three major causes of chest pain the cad the acs pulmonary embolism acute aortic dissection but uh, even though it is mentioned in some places it is it has, hasn't come as a recommendation as of now okay then toxic screen can be sent if the patient like if the patient is already on cocaine or something toxic screen can be sent if it need if needed but history and signs and in the other investigations are more specific and one question that i have seen is regarding advice to trial in all these md exams advice to trial it comes in that recent advances section uh, it's a novel a clinical alg algorithm for detection of acute aortic syndrome so the aortic dissection detection risk score addrs in combination with d dimo has been proposed and internally validated as a diagnostic algorithm but it has not been externally validated and it has got several uh, uh, problem issues also so it has been the advice the addrs scoring system has been uh, used for low to moderate risk patients for whom acute aortic syndromes are in the differential diagnosis so addrs and ddmr are meant to provide guidance in risk risk classification for patients who merit imaging so these are the questions this is this, this, this has been taken from md calc online so these are the questions that they ask any high risk condition causing aortic dissection such as marfan family family history of aortic disease known aortic valve disease recent aortic manipulation all these things 
any high risk pain features such as chest pain back pain abdominal pain abrupt onset severe intensity ripping tearing type of chest pain any high risk exam feature such as pulse deficit systolic bp like bp uh, differential or any focal neurological deficit new onset ar hypotension stop so based on this they will give scoring and finally uh this this is uh, scoring is meant to provide a guidance in risk stratification for who which patient merits image so the moving on to the treatment part pain has to be air, air, airway breathing circulation has to be definitely taken care as in any other emergency case take take care of abc but pain has also be has, has to be taken to consideration give uh, str- uh, iv opioids fentanyl or morphine or whatever you can give and if the history is suggest to a pyotic dissection never give antiplatelets heparin thrombolysis even if the ecg is suggest of stemi or n stemi because at all times rule out an aortic acute aortic dissection first because giving antiplatelets heparin and even giving thrombolysis can cause torrential uh, like uh, 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 bleeding and if not controlled properly like patient will definitely die so two possibilities should be kept in mind the acs as well as the acute aortic dissection and uh, always confirm an acute aortic dissection with imaging modalities always refer to a vascular or cvt surgeon for any cases suspected case of acute aortic dissection and most of the patients will be admitted and uh, decision regarding open repair or endovascular repair has to be done by the surgeon usually in type a dissections we patient go for open surgery that is to basically to prevent the rupture into the pericardial sac which may lead to a cardiac tamponade okay but in type b dissections usually they are managed medically but some cases may even go for endovascular stenting suppose if the patient has got a uh, persistent pain or if if, 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 the, if the aortic di- uh, diameter is expanding rapidly of the or if there is some malperfusion of branch vessel organs then uh, they may benefit if they like go ahead with endovascular stenting uh but if there is no evidence of ischemia usually medical management is sufficient for aortic dissection involving the descending aorta so that medical management is the aim is to uh, bring, bring, bring the bp target bp to around 100 to 120 mm mercury and also the heart rate to less than 60 per minute and uh, for that there is a terminology called anti impulse therapy okay and that is used to reduce the rate of progression decrease the velocity of lv contraction thereby decreasing shear stress in a minim- minimizing lesion progression so these are the things that are that are advised first thing is the negative inotropic agent that is meant to lower the bp without increasing shear force on the intimal flap of the aorta so there are two possibilities two options which you have one is labitalol other thing is esmolol Esmolol doses 250 microgram per kg IV over one minute, then 25 to 50 microgram per kg per minute, and the onset of action is around one to two minutes, and duration for around 10 to 30 minutes. Mm, labitalol dose is 0.25 mg per kg, followed by uh, repeat doses of 20 to 80 mg every 10 minutes, and that is titrated to uh, decide effect. And the maximum dose that is permissible is 300 mg. onset of action is 2 to 5 minutes duration 2 to 6 hours and once bp is controlled you can go ahead with a continuous infusion of 2 mg per minute labitalol infusion of 2 mg per minute but always bear in mind that you should avoid these things in cases of decompensated heart failure in such cases you can go ahead with a diltiazem or verapam then regarding vasodilators so once you have controlled the bp Uh, the, the once you have controlled the heart rate by esmolol or labitalol then you can go ahead with the vasodilator for uh, blood pressure control if your blood pressure is not still not controlled with these things esmolol or labitalol you can go ahead with vasodilators nicardipine infusion clavidipine ntg sodium nitroprusside but always remember avoid hydralazine one thing you have to bear in mind is in a case of acute aortic dissection with hemopericardium never attempt pericardiocentesis that is discouraged this is about aortic dissection 
the next uh, important entity is a symptomatic abdominal aortic aneurysm any case of abdominal aortic aneurysm if it becomes symptomatic is an emergency and majority of these aortic uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms are infra renal okay and the 5% cases can be renal or even visceral abdominal aortic aneurysm and if the in, infra renal abdominal aortic aneurysm diameter is more than or equal to 3 cm then it's called a abdominal aortic aneurysm supra renal abdominal uh, aortic uh, aorta can be termed to have aneurysm only if the um, diameter is more than 3.5 Centimeters, because because suprarenal aorta is naturally normally 0.5 centimeters larger than the infrarenal aorta, and usually surgeons go for repair if it is more than uh, or equal to five centimeters. And if the diameter is more than 5.5 centimeters, the risk for aortic aneurysm rupture increases. So, what are the risk factors for developing? aortic aneurysm abdominal aortic aneurysm there are two things risk factors for developing abdominal aortic aneurysm risk factors for aneurysm rupture okay the first thing is risk factor for developing abdominal aortic aneurysm if the patient has got a first degree relative with triple a uh, if the if he belongs to white race more than 60 years males more than females known hypertension hypertension hyperlipidemia peripheral arterial disease patients with history of other major artery aneurysms if there is a connective tissue disorder as i already mentioned in aortic dissection ehlers danlos marfan's lois yates turner and smoking this is very important while history taking smoking triple a is four times more in more smokers okay then what are the risk factors for aneurysm rupture if the aneurysm diameter is more than 5.5 that i already mentioned here patient is still smoking bp is elevated and if the aortic expansion rate is more than 0.5 cm per year normally we uh, for any patient diagnosed with an aneurysm we keep for, for like following up following them up every year to look for the uh, aortic expansion rate normally it should be less than 0.5 like uh, less than 0.5 cm per year but if it is more than 0.5 cm per year there are high chances that patient may go ahead with a triple a rupture and the patient if the patient has got a is, a is a female sex or if the symptoms are suggestive of aneurysm rupture such as abdominal pain then you'll have to always suspect a aneurysm rupture so aortic rupture is due to weakening of the aortic wall that which in turn leads to tearing of the aortic wall and that allows blood to escape outside the confines of the aorta and the presence of symptoms increases the risk for rupture and in the absence of rupture uh, pain or other symptoms attributable to aaa may indicate rapid expansion which, which may be causing compression of adjacent structures or an inflammatory or infected abdominal aortic aneurysm okay so what are the clinical features of abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture usually patient will have abrupt onset of back pain abdominal pain flank or groin pain ripping or tearing type this is similar to the acute uh, aortic dissection type b the descending which involves the descending aorta can mimic uh, type b aortic dissection or may be associated with nausea vomiting at times patient may 11% cases uh, patients may not have pain also then um, tenesmus then bilateral lower limb ischemia that is very common especially if there is an embolization of thrombus uh, in the aneurysm patient can have bilateral lower limb ischemia which is completely unrelated to the abdominal pain and patient may uh, take it for granted that it is something else okay sorry the doctors may take it for granted then if there is an unexplained gi bleeding from an aorta enteric fistula especially in patients who have got a history of uh, aortic graft replacement then if there is shock or if there is a intraperitoneal rupture leading to sudden death syncope all these things always bear in mind that any case of acute abdomen severe 
back pain, abdominal pain, flank pain, especially in the elderly uh, males more than 60 years, white who, who belong to the white race with chronic hypertension and also smoking, always suspected abdominal aortic aneurysm. Okay. So what are the signs that you'll get? A palpable pulsatile mass, tenderness of abdominal aortic aneurysm, hypotension, tachycardia, and uh, if there is a paraumbilical, paraumbilical echymosis, also called as Cullen sign, flank echymosis, called a Gray Turner sign, scrotum discoloration, called as Bryant's sign, proximal thigh echymosis, called as Fox's sign. Okay. And at times, what happens is the retroperitoneal blood may dissect into the perineum or groin, and that can cause carotid or vulvar or inguinal hematoma. And if there is a hematoma, naturally it will irritate the psoas muscle and that can cause psoas sign also and if the blood irritates the femoral nerve patient can have neuropathy and if there is an happens to be an aorta venous fistula that is aorta ivc communication there can be signs of high output cardiac failure okay but the triad of ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm which may, may be seen in one third of patients is abdominal pain pulsatile abdominal mass and hypotension okay So what are the investigations? Any unstable patient never shift the patient out of the ED because patient can crash. So bedside ultrasound is the modality of choice for screening. More than 90, it has got more than 90% sensitivity in trained uh, radiologists. And if the aortic diameter is more than three centimeters, it suggests acute aneurysmal disease. For stable patients, you may do a Abdominal X-ray, ultrasound, CT abdomen, IV contrast, MRI abdomen and all. In abdominal X-ray, it may show calcified and bulging aortic contour here. Calcified and bulging aortic contour. It can be seen more clearly in the lateral view. Usually in 65% of cases, you'll be able to see in lateral view itself. And then ultrasound scan. Ultrasound, is, this one shows a like, aortic aneurysm. Is showing some leak out outwards outwards okay triple a rupture but the best modality of treatment is always CT, ct abdomen with iv contrast or mri abdomen with iv contrast and the treatment treatment is uh, based on whether you diagnose the triple a at the right time or not and that is the duty of the emergency physician okay so early recognition and rapid surgical consultation is the key for treatment so always place to always make sure you take care of the abcs and all just like any other case two large bore iv cannula cardiac cardiac monitor oxygen as if it, the patient has got an asymptomatic triple a okay you can be uh, go ahead with medical or elective repair as decided by the surgeon but if it's unstable with ruptured triple a uh, then these they are, and if the patients are candidates for repair Generally, they are transferred directly from the emergency department to the OT. And always, just like aortic dissection, make sure you, con you control the pain with adequate analgesics, opioids. And the BP target is what they have mentioned is 80 to 100 mm. So this is this is the, the here comes the, the concept of permissive hypotension that is recommended to prevent further aortic tear. SPB of 80 to 100 mm is recommended to prevent further aortic tear. And another uh, target that they mentioned is the level of consciousness. The patient is, has got a proper level of consciousness. Uh, you can actually stop volume replacement. There is a small difference in the systolic target BP in aortic uh, aneurysm rupture and aortic dissection. In aortic dissection, it's 100 to 120. Here, it's 80 to 100. Okay. So, yeah, one more thing. Uh, the, for the BP control, here what they prefer is ethmolol, 1000 microgram per kg over 30 seconds, followed by 150 microgram per kg per minute infusion. And uh, just like any trauma case, they have advocated massive transfusion protocol also. So low ratio blood product transfusion may benefit. And uh, in the setting of ruptured uh, AAA, uh, the surgeon can go uh, like consider the possible the 
the possibility of reboa that means to resuscitate to endovascular balloon occlusion of aorta to occlude aorta above the aneurysmal rupture so that has to be uh, the call has to be made by the surgeon another other thing which with, with with which patients can present to the ed is following a reboa patient can have some complications such as graft leak occlusion renal dysfunction aorta enteric fistula bowel ischemia with all these uh, complications also patient can present to the emergency department so there is a two fold risk of perioperative mortality in symptomatic aaa uh, and the seven fold risk of perioperative mortality in ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm so hope all of you have understood what have been have been said so far so for exam purpose usually what they ask is what i have seen is a short note on aortic syndromes so list the various the seven things which i have already mentioned here and with this spe special focus on aortic dissection intramural hematoma penetrating aortic ulcer and ruptured aa so the treatment how do you treat the, the uh, various aortic uh, rupture ruptured aortic aneurysm or uh, aortic dissection the various bp targets you have to mention and another question is the advised trial that has also been asked previously in, uh, and that uh, that has also to be that is to be remembered okay so hope all of you have understood what have been said so far thank you